This series of videos introduces the 38 chapters of the Routledge Handbook of Environmental Movements. It's a project of the Social Change Lab, and we gratefully acknowledge the support of the Mary Lee bequest for the work of our team. Hi, I'm Winifred Lewis. I'm a professor in psychology at the University of Queensland. Hi, I'm Sarah Picard, senior lecturer and researcher at the Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris. Hello, I'm Ben Berman. Uh, I'm at the Manchester Centre for Youth Studies in Manchester in the UK, and I'm a senior lecturer uh, in the sociology department at Manchester Metropolitan University. Hi, everybody. My name is Dana Aria, and I'm a doctoral researcher in politics at Nottingham Trent University in the UK. Hi, everyone. I'm Shum, and I'm an undergraduate psychology student at the University of Queensland. And I think you were going to lead us into this next part, right, Chu? What was the question you had? Right, yes. And so now that we're into the thick of the discussion, let's talk about um, what everyone's reaction has been in relation to uh, youth activism in relation to the environment in particular from leaders of society. And how has this been so far in terms of uh, their reactions? Um. I think uh, there are really, uh, as we mentioned in the chapter, there's two types of uh, reactions. One of them is really kind of enthusiastic. You know, young people are the hope of the world. They're inspirational. They're going to save the world. They're going to save everything, which is kind of putting a lot of responsibility on young people's shoulders when they don't. Many of them don't even have the right to vote, and it's not up to them. And also kind of sycophantic, uh, you know, praising of young people and how marvelous they are. And then, uh, but that they're not following it up with actually concrete policies, you know, making promises and pledges, which kind of makes the young people involved even more despondent and more distrusting of those political elite. And then on the other hand, uh, we've been seeing, uh, we've seen and we write about uh, politicians like Donald Trump, who are uh, very critical of uh, Greta Thunberg, who reacted with good humor, or Scott Morrison uh, before he stepped down or was forced out in Australia. Australia, highly critical, saying young people should be in school and leave the politics to the politicians and the young people are not, you know, capable of taking uh, political decisions. Or in France, we've got centre-right politicians, one of whom, when Greta Thunberg came to Paris, said that she was a female prophetess in short trousers, you know, proclaiming doom and gloom, which is highly undermi undermining of her, but also reveals some kind of fear, I suspect, about her actual power uh, and the critical mass of young people who are supporting her so undermining them undermining her but also uh, kind of removes the responsibility of governments and politicians to act because if if young people or her in particular are not capable of take you know making reasonable decisions or reasonable demands then we, then we don't have to listen to them Ben what do you think thanks um, I think it would be uh, remiss of me not to mention that you're speaking to us um, in July 2022, amid what's predicted to be the highest European temperature of all time, uh, we're in a heat wave where people are roasting and people will die. Um, and that's to say nothing of what happens uh, in other parts of the world. And so for, um, for, I mean, I'm speaking from Europe, so I'm experiencing it, but it's something that we've experienced for decades. In fact, the scientific evidence of the scientific um, uh, knowledge about climate change has been around for decades, if not centuries. Uh, Thomas Edison wrote about it. So, um, so for somebody to describe somebody like Greta Thunberg as a prophetess is not only uh, disrespectful to the work that she's doing, but it's it's a barefaced lie. Uh, these aren't future problems. These are problems that young people know and experience. And so, when you look at it from a young people's perspective, you see these adults who either celebrate you in tokenistic ways by saying, oh, it's wonderful we had young people in the room. Let's completely ignore everything they said. At, at least it inspired us and now we'll move on to do whatever we decided to do beforehand. Um, or you, uh, adults who uh, will tell them they need to be in school or they need to be going out and getting a job um, uh, um, when all that's going around them is, 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 is what it is. We're in a climate crisis. So a lot of the, the young perspective on this is frustration, um, uh, loneliness, uh, anxiety, um, but also trying to find networks and communities around them of adults, but also young people 
uh, um, uh, building communities with other young people to say, look at all this uh, that's going on. It's so frustrating. It's so isolating. What can we do together? How can we imagine something different? Because uh, what's going on in Parliament or what's going on with our president uh, sure isn't helping us. Yeah, it's so true. And it's so powerful. I mean, it's a movement that, as we talked about earlier in part one, has seen millions and millions of people um, communicating online and on the streets. And a movement that large, of course, has a lot of diversity in it as well. That's something you've talked about, Denna. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a few thoughts I have uh, that I'll share, but firstly, in, in terms of this kind of focus that adults have had around the reactions to young people and sometimes the, um, the focus on the more high profile. And so looking at people like um, Greta Thunberg, but then yeah. also showing us that um, even in focusing on high profile activists, there are inequalities that come up there um, and injustice in the way they're all treated. Uh, an example being at the, um, I think it was two years ago now at the Davos um, World Economic Forum where Vanessa Nakati was also present. Um, journalists took photos of the young activists who took part and cut um, Vanessa Nakati out. She's from, uh, she's an activist from Uganda. Um, and so creating this idea that it's a, um, and I would say that th they are creating an idea uh, that it's a white middle-class female movement. Um, and that really does delete some of the other voices, the less high profile voices that are taking part in these global networks that Ben and Sarah have been talking about. And just to speak a little bit to, um, to that idea of the networks that are building, the, the use of technology, the, the interesting thing that has come from seeing young people use the digital space um, is in networking. Yes, they do activism online. So you see things like Twitter storms, um, digital strikes, but I think one of the really important and interesting elements of using technology is to build the networks to go and then do activism in other spaces, whether that's online or offline. Um, and using that space can in some, in some aspects be um, an equalizer in the sense that you're able to get young people who otherwise would not be able to connect with activists in London, with uh, whoever it might be, um, from, uh, from sorry non-urban areas, from rural areas, um, to participate. And so in a way that it can be um, somewhat of an equalizer, and then at times not at all, if you think about those who do not have access um, to the digital space, um, or do not have access um, and or the ability to engage with that space in the same way as others. Um, so yeah, just some thoughts about the inequalities, but also inequalities that are created from the digital um, space with potentially less high profile activists. Anything that Ben and Sarah could add to that point? One point that I um, think of as you raise it is that, um, you know, your, your data as we haven't perhaps talked enough about is diverse. It's drawn from different cities. It's drawn from different countries. Do you want to speak a little bit to the similarities and differences across those contexts? I think one uh, similarity, if there is one, and Dana speaks well to the to the point that young people are not a monolith. Or young people are, I mean, it's a very wide demographic that involves everybody. Um, so, uh, but um, one thing that I think it's probably fair to say is that young people tend to be more towards the environmental justice perspective, tend to be more towards the perspective of other marginalized groups in their activism and saying basically that um, the world is unfair from pillar to post. And what we don't need is small adjustments to make the world we've got sustainable. What we need is ideas and thoughts and uh, solidarities that can build a better, fairer one. And I would point out, uh, and I think it's important that in the period that we were studying, so 2018, 2019, uh, uh, and onwards, this was a really huge um, uh, moment of contentious politics that also involved the Black Lives Matter movement um, worldwide. And the young activists that we spoke to were really, really interested in those solidarities and really working to build those solidarities between movements. So that's one, uh, thinking about justice, thinking about a better world, not just a sustainable one, but a better one, a more just one and looking for solidarities with other people and other movements. Mm, Sarah? Yeah. yeah, I would just add that uh, also other issues that are more kind of uh, socially liberal about 
issues of feminism and that so there's all different kinds of issues and values that we're seeing among these activists because we've been interviewing them in depth that we see that this interest in being involved in networks and movements where their voices can be heard or whether they feel that they can participate in a more not necessarily democratic but in a fairer way in a more horizontal way and this because they're more attractive uh, where you can part you, you can do your do ourselves politics but you can participate you can protest you can care you can share you can talk you feel you belong you can use your agency as opposed to traditional party politics or trade unions where much more hierarchical top down and even within youth wings and youth sections of political parties the young people there are like um they're electioneers they're useful for campaigning but they don't have much input in actually policy development uh, or are not really listened to they're more like tokenistic uh bit pieces as opposed to legitimate part of the party politics and so these movements uh, give a more uh, a better environment to be able to talk about those issues but there's certainly and what we've seen because these interviews that are in the chapter we've all carried on doing interviews since then at COP26 and in, in our towns etc and that you see that um, the arguments are not, not more sophisticated, but many more links are being made between, you know, um, environmental justice, social justice, economic justice, inequalities and fairness. And that um, it's a whole part, the environment is one whole part of a much bigger thing about a way of doing politics from the political elite, but uh, on an individual and a collective level and that everything is connected and that, so that's why we're seeing more uh, about uh, discussions about the importance of linking the global north and the global south, but capitalism and a different way of doing politics. And that it means that there, it means that, you know, it's not just about polar bears. I think Denner and Ben and I are gonna write an article one day, it's not just polar bears, but it's much more sophisticated than that. And it not only shows that the young people are thinking because those that were, those who were 16 in 2018, of course, they're now uh, 20 today. And so they're maturing and others are coming on board and we have more information. And as Ben just said, it's 40 degrees in Paris today and in England and London as well. What is happening? And so, and, the lack of political or the political inertia or the lip service paid to environmental issues and the lip service paid to young people of those politicians that do su suggest that they're doing something this makes looking for looking to the future if we try to project forward i that things are these young people as they get older there's this period effect they're going to carry on their engagement and their concerns and their distrust or the mistrust or the disappointment in, in politicians and we can imagine something uh going forward that this is not going to just fizzle out. What do you think, guys? Yeah, I um, would just like to just echo that a little bit to say that um, what's been interesting is that um, a lot of the young people that uh, we've been talking to, interviewing, um, are from the Global North. But, um, and you know, you could typify them as well. They're middle class. We actually, we didn't, we weren't able to, to pick up data specifically about their socioeconomic status, but there are loads of assumptions out there that young people are middle class and white and um, come from a place of uh, post-material values are able to engage in these issues because they're cause related and they're linked to their lifestyles. And um, some of the things that come out of our research is that, and other people doing similar research to us, um, is that uh, these are material issues that they're talking about and that they're struggling with, and not only material issues that affect them personally, but they recognize that affect young people across and other people across uh, the planet. And these are issues of solidarity, as, as Ben and Sarah have both been saying. And so um, whether or not they are directly affected by environmental issues, whether they're dealing with drought or not dealing with drought or um, all the different consequences of the environmental crisis, those are recognized. And so um, seeing things like young people taking up um, support of Black Lives Matters, of trade union strikes, um, seeing them stand with um, members of the, the UCU, the academic community in the UK and, and lots of other groups shows that this is not just about um, environmental issues, about climate issues, but about justice overall. And that takes into consideration human and non-human non life. It's so um, interesting. And part of what you're talking about is a debate about um, the motivation that people have for protesting going all the way back to the 60s in sociology, where there was a distinction that 
was made between these economically minded um, labor movements of the past or a grievance based action and the sort of identity based or symbolic action which somehow was positioned as being quite different and apart from uh, issues of economic um, livelihoods and that's been challenged in multiple ways you know throughout the chapters of the handbook and being challenged um, by uh, Dana here and by the participants um, that they're saying look you know the environment is part of the issue of livelihoods it's part of the issue of heat and uh, morbidity and mortality um, from health it's part of material concerns and um, it, you know it can't be dissociated from that as well as this other theme throughout the handbook chapters that initially environmentalists um, you know stood apart from social um, arguments, at least in the global north, in a way that they don't in the global south and in many communities of color and um, where poverty is more uh, a daily reality. And that now the, the global environmental movement has pivoted towards that and really um, embraced it as an issue. So the theme of climate justice or environmental justice speaks to the importance of transforming social relations, because, you know, we're not apart from nature, we're actually we are within nature. <laughs> we are a part of nature. Um, so um, just commenting on some of those themes, Dana, for the benefit of others who might not have read the, the rest of the, the theories and chapters. I want to um, think about how we can wrap up this incredibly interesting chapter in a mere, um, you know, uh, six minutes or so. I think there's really so much we could talk about. Um, one of the themes that are, that I think of that maybe we haven't touched on uh, to this point is what you talked about as performative and creative, um, you know, ways of protesting. That, I mean, maybe I'm hearkening back to something that um, that I'm particularly interested in myself. Like, in the um, in the work that I've looked at with youth activism, the themes that come from our limited forays so far into this area have been around nihilistic despair. So the idea that um, for many young people, they're looking at the world and thinking, wow, we might already have missed the window to act. We might be, um, you know, we might be too late. Um, and that is associated sometimes with apathy or alienation and, um, you know, anxiety and depression, but sometimes with particular forms of um, kind of grief-based um, poetry, art. Um, I wonder if you've had any, com if you'd like to comment on that um, and more broadly on that tension between, you know, communicating positive and negative um, emotions in their art and how that plays into how they're received. I'm just picking up on the way that when they're positive, young people are described as naive. <laughs> when they're negative, young people are described as having no sense of perspective. <laughs> but maybe I'm putting words in your mouth. What do you think, um, Ben, Sarah, and Dana? No, you're not putting words into our mouth. We wrote a blog for the LSC blog about young people are not immature, uh, which is what one of the young people said. But just picking up about what you said about nihilism, that's really... It's, it's big. I interviewed somebody in uh, Trafalgar Square the day before all the tents were cleared by the London police under Metropolitan Police. She was leaning in Trafalgar Square and I said, so why, why do you do this? And she said, well, before I used to be a nihilist, I just thought it was all, do I thought it was all gonna end and I was on my own and I felt really sad and I couldn't do anything. I've been waiting for this, I remember, I've been waiting for this for 10 years. But doing this has changed everything and it's given me hope and it's given me, uh, I think we can manage to do something, etc." And it's a young woman in her early, very early 30s who traveled there deliberately to be here. And the next day, all the Metropolitan Police cleared all the tents, uh, judged illegal by the High Court subsequently. And I'm just wondering what she's thinking now, because what really what we said, and I think this really comes through because we've done all these interviews over several years now in different places, that if you don't listen to, if you don't listen or listen attentively to what these young people are saying, we don't have an understanding about what's going on and we all three of us always say that young people it's not a heterogeneous group i think that's really, that clear that comes clearly through not a monolithic group but there is something that we keeps coming through this is highly emotional relationship to what's going on but also to their actions that they're doing them and that um that taking part gives some kind of hope a sense of belonging faced with what's going on and that they want to be heard, they consistently say they want to be heard. 
and some people will be disruptive actors and some don't know that but they feel that they're not being listened to and it's i think it's just really uh, what you know what's going on when politicians just pay lip service or tokenism or or just uh, you know just dis disparaging marks what kind of image does that give about adults or our stakeholders politicians to these young people and i find it quite concerning that you know that what these young people that are finding hope uh, uh will uh moving on will be thinking if something isn't really radical isn't Done. I think that's a good way to put it. And I, I think that I remember when we first went to do field work at Climate Strikes, and Sarah, you said, I've been doing uh, work in different uh, demonstrations and different protests for years, and this is the happiest, most joyful one. Um, there was such joy as well as such anxiety and, and such love and hope there and care for others. Um, uh, people speaking to us in interviews about how they wanted to be there to support others uh, as much as they did to speak for themselves. Um, uh, people holding up signs that were basically about listening to others rather than their own message, as well as jokes and song lyrics and all sorts of um, paintings and drawings and hand hand sewn um, uh, um, uh, crafted banners and things like that really fantastically beautiful uh, complex um, emotional kind of interwoven um, experience being at, at young demonstrations and I think working with young people in general not just at mass demonstrations but also in reading groups or in classrooms or in school groups or um, or in workplaces that this is what young people this is the way that young people are approaching this issue by sharing with others and by having this interesting interlinked kind of sense of the, the ideas and the debates and the practices, but also the emotions and the feeling and the, the care for others. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, what young people feel now, you know, what, what will they feel looking back? I wonder what politicians feel looking back because I, I mean, I live in Manchester. I've been to climate demonstrations where the mayor was and now we're in uh, history's hottest heat wave. Uh, I wonder whether he's looking back and thinking, I was there in, in St. Peter's Square, the city square, with hundreds, if not thousands of young people who were willing to take the entire day simply to ask for something to happen, full of enthusiasm, full of ability, and ready to do something about it. And what happened? I think very little. And I wonder how many people in power are looking at this, uh, um, this global movement and saying, uh, wow, we've got some real potential here, which we've completely left out. Um, uh, we should be doing better. I hope that they all feel that way, but I wonder if there's at least one thinking they should have done better. I hope so too, Ben. Um, what about you, Shu? What final thoughts do you have or questions at this point in time in our recording? Oh. I have no further questions, but uh, it is interesting to see how this will evolve over time to see what other kinds of uh, movements and um, approaches future generations will take that will build off um, what we've seen with uh, this generation. Yeah, I really hope that, as Sarah says, it just becomes a kind of cohort effect where they carry they carry their activism uh, into their older ages and draw others in behind them. Um, so that there's a transform transformation of the movement. What do you think? Yeah. Well, um, you've uh, it, this this part of the conversation has made me think a little bit about um, the way in which young people have been inviting adults to ally with them and support um, support the work they're doing. Um, when you go into, I'm just actually reflecting upon um, the first. Fridays for Future um, demonstration I attended, um, and the last one, which was at COP26. Um, fundamental difference being the way in which young people are inviting um, adults to be with, stand with, and, and work in solidarity with them. Um, the first protest that I ever attended was in Edinburgh, where um, I saw adults um, allying, but supporting from the wayside. So they were all kind of right at the back, doing a semicircle and just watching the, the young people take joy, dance together, sing together, um, talk, 
show their frustrations, um, have that whole range of emotions, but the adults felt it looked like uh, adults were feeling very uncomfortable to participate and there was a lot of hovering back and watching. Um, but at the COP26 demonstrations, what really stood out and what I thought was beautiful um, was the way in which young people had clearly organized uh, purposefully to allow and to create space for adults to participate with them, to stand with them and to ally with them. Um, and this isn't this, you know, talking about young people's environmental activism, it is not a youth specific issue and they recognize that. And so the work that we're seeing happening um, in protests, outside of protest spaces, is happening with adults. So for sure, we'd hope that adults, as Ben said, would be um, changing the way they're thinking. But then I think there are also adults who um, young people are inviting in um, to, to ally with them. Wonderful. Yeah, I look forward to those interviews as well. Um, the new wave that you folks have from COP26. Well, um, if everyone's ready, I might just say uh, again, thank you very much to the author team for making it here today. It's just such a pleasure to hear from your analysis of this rich chapter. And thank you to Shu um, for coming here today and many days and um, being with us for the recording. And thank you to our viewers if you're here with us to the end of the video. Bye now. Bye. For those of you watching, be sure to subscribe and follow us at Social Change UQ. And check out our website for more videos.